All right, guys. So today we will talk about pathomechanics of injury, healing, and response. Um, as you can see, back home finally from the beach uh, in our home office doing this. So uh, I'm a Buffalo Bills fan, as you can see from my hat. Uh, not a Redskins fan. Also, my cat might pop in. She loves the computer. Just ignore her. <laughs> All right, so the objectives of today's lecture, as you can see here, Star Starling's Law, understand some basic types of nerve fibers, some basic physiology of acute injuries, and, and, and whatnot. So some of this might be a little bit of a review from, uh, you know, an, ad an anatomy physiology course, especially if you had a really good A&P course. I've found, though, most students struggle with the physiology. They like anatomy. I always loved anatomy. I could I could touch this muscle or touch this bone and, and, and understand it. But the physiology aspect was a lot harder for me and I think it is for most students. So this introduction here, what is stress? Well, the stress is a force that disrupts normal homeostasis. That could be a stress from an outside environment such as, you know, uh, relationships, um, you know, physical stress that, that people go through as well. But emotional stress, I think, has a big underlying of uh, people's perception of pain and how they heal, actually, as well. And there's a lot of research out there that shows if you are more stressed, right, if you work a high-stress job, say a police officer or a firefighter, you're probably going to have a shorter lifespan and sustain more injury than those of us that are less stressed. As you can probably tell, I'm a pretty laid back kind of guy. Um, it takes a lot to stress me out. I always say, Jimmy Buffett's my idol. I'm a, I'm a five o'clock somewhere kind of guy. Let's find a beach and relax. Um, doesn't mean I don't have injury or, or actually do have stress, but other outside stresses, especially for college students, you know, money. Where are they gonna find money to, to pay a student loan or, or something from financial aid or to live off of. Um, relationship stress, I think, is a big one, especially in, in college. Um, other stresses of, of the body, well, you have exercise. Obviously, if, if you see this a lot, freshman year of college, student athletes come in and they start getting hurt more because they're not used to the high demands that, that the college athlete must undertake especially the higher level college athletes, say Division One, you know, these student athletes might be very good at their high school team and be their star of their high school team, and then they come into college, and now they're working essentially year-round as their job to play volleyball or basketball or whatever the sport might be, and that's where we see a lot more stress reactions, stress fractures, all right? So do modal modalities speed the healing of an injury? No, actually they don't. Uh, they provide the optimal environment for healing to occur, so we can change the environment, right, that, that healing needs to occur in. And we've talked about modality, right, right? What is a modality? It's a form of stress applied to the body for the purpose of eliciting an involuntary physiological response. So let's say compression wrap. I'm using an ACE wrap after I sprain my ankle, right? I'm not... I, I'm not, how do I want to say this? I'm not telling my body to vasoconstrict, right? Constrict the blood vessels, vasoconstriction, constricting the blood vessels. Um, when I put that ACE wrap on, it is constricting the blood vessels for me, right? So I, it's an involuntary response. If we leave the blood vessels open, vasodilated, right, you're going to have a lot of swelling and exudate, all the stuff we don't want come into the area. So that's why ACE wrap actually is probably the best thing you can do right away, compress maybe ice for pain, but we'll get to that. Right, so application of a modality at the improper point may hinder the healing process and using the correct form of energy based on the stage of inflammation that promotes healing. So if I have, if I sprain my ankle today, mowing my lawn, it could happen, I'm pretty clumsy, and I come in the house and I put a hot pack on it, it's the worst thing I can do, right? So we know physiologically that 
blood vessels vasodilate with heat. So if I want to prevent more swelling from coming in the area, that's the last thing I want to do immediately, right, is to put a hot pack on because that's going to cause more vasodilation. For years, researchers thought putting ice on it could help vasoconstrict. Well, what we know now is that the ice will not be able to penetrate deep enough to actually vasoconstrict the blood vessel. So pretty much when you put the ice pack on, let's say a sprained ankle, it may go through the superficial layer of skin, right? It goes through the skin, then it has a layer of fat, and then it has a layer of muscle, depending what body part, you know, if you put it on your gluteus maximus, your butt, which has more muscle and fat, right, than your ankle does, that's going to take a long time to, to uh, actually get to the blood vessels. So, normal individual, you sprain your ankle, putting an ice pack on, it may take anywhere from 40 to 45 minutes to vasoconstrict the blood vessel, but we have a whole lot of other things going on physiologically that doesn't make sense to put the ice pack on for 45 minutes. We'll get there. As you can tell, I like ice for some reason. So this is a physical stress theory. This actually is on the BOC, the Board of Certification Exam, every now and then. So stress is pla <coughs> excuse me, placed on tissues. It describes how the tissues react relative to amount of stress they receive relative to normal, right? So if we don't stress the cells or, or tissues at all, you can see that cell death will occur. So this actually is pretty common in quadriplegics, uh, individuals that are on ventilators that, that may be in comas. They're not stressing their body, right? So therefore, now they're losing muscle mass and all that, right? But it goes all the way to the extreme that if you stress your body too much, so you in, in the heat and you're going through heat stroke, right, where your body core temperature is up about 107, 108, 109 degrees, now our body can't handle that, cell death occurs. What we see a lot after injury is this low stress level and we have atrophy. So atrophy usually means decrease in muscle tone, right? Say I have an ACL surgery or I fracture my forearm. I'm in a cast after my forearm. Let's see that one. Oh, I got an email. When my arm's in the cast, I can't move it, right? I can't strengthen anything. So therefore, my muscles uh, have a low physical stress level. Therefore, I have atrophy. What we see a lot in, in weightlifters, hypertrophy, right? I'm working out. I'm getting swole, as the kids say now. <laughs> you know, I'm working out. I'm trying to build muscle mass. That's hypertrophy. So what we see a lot of in college athletics especially is this low after an injury and then this area of high and extreme. If we stress the body too much, we're going to have injury. If we stress it extremely much, we're going to have tissue death, which actually could result in death of an individual or depending how much we, we stress that, right? The general adaptation syndrome or GAS. I don't know why they abbreviated GAS. It's weird, right? Uh, the three stages of stress response. We have the alarm stage. The body's initial sudden reaction to change in stress, the F or F, right? The flight or flight response, fight or flight response. The body's initial reaction to the change in stress, right? If you go to a haunted house uh, over Halloween, my wife's definitely afraid of these things, right? And, uh, I don't know, a, a scare, not a scarecrow, come on. <laughs> Something scarier than a scarecrow jumps out at you at the... Uh, haunted house, what are you going to do? You're going to freeze and stand there? Or are you going to run? Or are you going to fight? That's that alarm stage. The resistance stage, the body continues to adapt to the stressor by using homeostatic resources to maintain its integrity. This could take days, months, or even years. If you think about like Olympic athletes, right? The Rio games are coming up. This is the stage that a lot of these, these uh, Olympic athletes are in right now because they're in mesocycles and macrocycles which is a strength and conditioning term, but the resistance stage is the longest stage. The exhaustion stage occurs when the body cannot withstand stresses. Clinically, this stage may be present as traumatic or overuse injuries. So if we see a lot of tendinopathy, I don't really use that word tendinitis. I use that word tendinopathy more, right? Also, <clears throat> if we see stress fractures, stress reactions, in that cross-country runner. Why do cross-country? I'm not a runner. 
So I pick on cross-country runners and distance runners a lot. How can you run 100 miles a week for fun? That seems like torture to me, but people do it, right? I can never do that. Harmful stresses. Harmful stresses may cause acute injury, all right? So macro trauma, if we look at the big picture, right, macro, if you sprain a ligament, remember, we sprain ligaments, we strain muscles. If you sprain your anterior talofibular ligament, which is your ankle bone or ankle ligament, right, one of the three lateral ankle ligaments, cell death occurs instantly. Different grades of sprains, right, grade one through grade three, all right, grade three usually means that that uh, ligament is torn completely, um, so cell death occurs instantly. Strain or a fracture, right? Repeated relatively low intensity forces can cause chronic injury. Stress fractures, stress reactions, that's what we see a lot more in the, in the uh, distance runners, um, swimmers even, chronic inflammatory conditions. Again, swimmers get this all the time. <clears throat> Tendinopathy, muscle soreness. Um, back to the macro trauma. These are the big picture things that you see. You watch any NFL game, right? These are the things you're seeing that the athletic trainers running out on the field for, right? The defensive back just planted, turned to go up the field, and now he falls to the ground, grabbed his knee while he probably just tore his ACL. Or the baseball player running to first base. Baseball players are a little out of shape. I played baseball, but <laughs> he's running to first base and trying to leg out a single. Grabs the back of his hamstring like he got shot in the hamstring by a sniper. That's a strain. That's the macro trauma. Fracture, right? You're watching a, a soccer game and they come in for a slide tackle and they snap the tib fib and now it's sticking through the skin. That's awesome. That's that's the fun stuff. Well, not really fun stuff, right? But that's the stuff that... ATs, athletic trainers, get geeked out about. That sounds weird, but you'll get it. Uh, the chronic injuries is something that I think a lot of athletic trainers don't get really how to treat that well because we're not taught that well, at least back in the day in college, how to treat a lot of these things properly. Um, I actually like the chronic injuries better now than the acute injuries. I like treating them better. I'm pretty good at treating tendinopathies. I can usually fix your pain. Um, from a tendinopathy or an inflammatory condition that day, if you walk into my clinic and you're a 10 out of 10 out of pain, I can almost always take away your pain uh, completely that day, which I know it sounds like I'm tooting my own horn, <laughs> but you'll see. You'll see later. I can take away headaches too. We'll do that in, uh, on campus. Wolf's Law. Awesome law. You're probably going to hear it a lot this summer and, and throughout your, the program here. Essentially, it says bone adapts the forces placed upon it, all right? <clears throat> Deposition of collagen in response to stressors. So we want to stress new bone formation or any tissue formation really properly. If we don't stress the tissue properly, we're going to have bad scar tissue form. We're not going to have it in alignment how we want it. So osteoblasts and osteoclasts, right? Osteoblasts help build bone osteoclasts help break down bone, right? So in running, what does this do? So running can stress your body, right? So we can be building or maintaining bone. However, if we go back a couple of slides here and we get up into this moderate to extreme range, we could actually stress the tissue too much and now we can cause injury. Geriatrics, so older population, right? Geriatrics. We see this a lot. You hear this a lot on the TV and the news. Older people should walk every day, exercise, um, keep it moving, keep your body moving because that'll help build bone. Well, yeah, in geriatric population, as they old, their mineral deposits in their bone decreases, right? So they have osteo, um, not osteoblast, that's up there. Wow, osteoporosis. Um, so exercising daily walking can maintain or even build up that bone for the geriatric population. Ha, immobilization after injury or surgery. So 
I hate immobilization. After you sprain your ankle, almost everyone sprained their ankle before, right? You sprain your ankle, you go to that hospital, which you probably shouldn't do because you didn't use clinical prediction rules, which I may actually talk about a little bit, but I'm sure your eval classes will. Get an x-ray, nothing's fractured. Well, yeah, I know that. They put you in those, those like, greenish, like, seafoamy colored, like, immobilizer things. I hate those things. The worst thing you can do after an ankle sprain is immobilize it. Move it. Get it moving. You're actually going to have less pain and an increase in healing if you move it. Immobilization, yes, at times is needed after an injury, after surgery. But I always try moving it the, as fast as I can. All right. So, stress in its relationship to treatment. So, how do we take that stress that that patient, student athlete might be under and relate that to what we're actually going to do to help them? So if an intensity of a modality or intervention is too low, the treatment duration is too low, little or no benefit is gained. Well, that makes sense, right? So if we put a 60 degree ice pack, cold pack, right, which is actually pretty warm, on the body for about five minutes, that's going to do nothing. It, it may be a lukewarm on your skin. That's about it. However, if the modality is too great or applied at the wrong point in the healing process, further injury occurs. So if you put a moist hot pack on with no covering, these things are, you know, 100 plus degrees in the hydroculator. You put this on a patient with no covering, you're going to cause, you know, second, third degree burns. You could have blistering and that's a lawsuit. Don't ever do that. But that's just an example, obviously two extremes of what not to do. So these two slides up or these two uh, topics here, epithelial and adipose tissue, we're going to kind of fly through, right? Epithelial tissue, really the skin's outer layer, formed by stratum corneum, uh, flat, densely packed dead cells. Energy produced by modalities must pass through that corneum and the remainder of the epidermis, dermis, and adipose tissues to get to the target, right? Adipose tissue is fat. <laughs> That's the nice way uh, of calling somebody fat. If you want to say that, that a little overweight I got too much adipose tissue around my belly right now. You know, I've ate out all week in Baltimore, Ocean City. I've ate out every meal. Whoa, I need to go on a detox. 21-day fix. Here we come. Anywho, adipose tissue consists of fat cells, high water content. So this is great for ultrasound, which we'll learn about later. Not like the ultrasound you get if you're pregnant, the therapeutic intervention ultrasound. Even diathermy. Diathermy is a form of heat that kind of died out back uh, in the 2000s, but it's kind of making a comeback. These things are cyclical, as you'll see. Um, yeah. Some basic muscle, again, this should be review. So smooth muscle, where's it found? Well, hollow organs. Cardiac muscle, where's that found? Uh, the heart, right? Skeletal muscle, where are these found? You have type 1, type 2, type 2A, type 2X. There's, you know, I'm not going in depth into this. We don't need to. Same thing here. Types of tissues found in the body. Type 1, 2, A, X, all these, right? Slow twitch versus fast twitch. Aerobic, right? With oxygen, anaerobic, without oxygen. This is not necessarily the basis of this class yet. We may hit this again more in depth when we start talking about some of the therapeutic rehab uh, basic principles later this summer. This stuff we actually do need to know. So nervous tissue, the central nervous system, which you'll see CNS all the time, abbreviated, right, consists of your brain and spinal cord. Your peripheral nervous system, are all, or PNS, are all nerves leading to and from the brain and spinal cord. This affects your pain, right? pain signals with the peripheral and central nervous system, all right? So if I, I don't know, hit my hand here, bam, hit my hand. If I hit that hard enough and that hurt, that's my peripheral nervous system going up my body to the spinal cord, up my brain, back down, and back out, right? So what I just described to you is a first order and second order neuron, and also afferent and efferent. So an afferent type of tissue is carrying impulses towards the central nervous system, towards the brain and spinal cord. Bam. 
hit my arm. Going here, all right? Hit my hand. My afferent pathways are going here to my spinal cord and then back up the brain. Efferent carried impulses away from the central nervous system. So it's come back down, back down, back down to my hand, to my peripheral nervous system and says, oh, yep, that wasn't a pain. But that's not, that feels good. Yeah, that, that's a massage. Or no, that, that is pain, all right? So afferent, efferent, very important with types of pain receptors. Types of skeletal muscular tissues continued. So we have these things called axons. We have A alpha, A beta, A delta, and C fibers. You need to take a screenshot of this, print this slide off, whatever it is. This is important. You can see the two A alphas, 1A, 1B. They kind of always lump them together, if you will. And they have a function. Type 1A or A alpha is a muscle spindle afferent. Remember, afferent impulses towards the brain and spinal cord. You can see the diameter. Micrometer is UM, um, micrometer, right? You can see the conduction velocity. They're kind of fast, A alpha. That gets important because if I hit my hand here and I want to override my pain, I can rub it at a velocity faster than the 720 meters per second, and that may stimulate something else that overrides the pain. A TENS unit can do that, right? Interferential current, ice maybe, right? A-alpha also does Golgi tendon organs. So Golgi tendon organs are uh, proprioceptors within uh, tendons. A beta does touch, pressure, secondary muscle. You can see they're a little smaller, but they do touch and pressure. So if I'm touching my finger like ET, phone home, right? If I'm touching my finger. I know I'm touching that due to my A beta fibers. If I'm putting pressure here, I know that. But if I have too much pressure, if I have an elephant sitting on my foot, I'm going to know that due to my A beta fiber. My A delta fibers are sharp pain. A delta sharp pain. Again, important because when you learn how to do an evaluation and you ask your patient, what type of pain are you experiencing? And you may give them examples, sharp, dull, achy, burning, whatever it might be. And they say sharp pain, that's usually an A delta fiber. And we can manipulate the modality to treat that A delta. Same thing, your C fibers do temperature and dull pain. So they're the ones that know I have a dull ache, I have a toothache, and my low back is just a dull ache all the time. That is your C fiber. That is what we see more, I think, with chronic pain patients. Right? So you can see the, the left here, 1A, B, 2, all this, they almost never use those terms. I will not use those terms. I will always use A alpha. That's together, lumped together, A beta, A delta, and C. Really the main ones we like in this course are these three, A delta, A beta, and C fibers. So those are all the afferent, right? Afferent, remember, impulses towards the brain. <clears throat> oh, look, we have A alpha, A gamma, and A beta. Efferent, why do they do that, right? They're all the, yeah. Anywho. A alpha efferent, remember efferent, carrying impulses away from the central nervous system. So A alpha, skeletal muscle. A gamma is muscle spindle. So muscle spindles are found in muscle. They work with interfusal fibers to tell if a muscle has been stretched or not. They initiate the stretch reflex even. And then you have A beta, which are muscle, muscle spindle uh, fiber as well. Um, we'll hit this more in depth here in a second. So this handout, refer to types and, uh, and function of peripheral nerve document on Blackboard. I created this for my students at MCLA um, and they love it. This is like the best thing that I've ever created, <laughs> right? So this is the chart and it has afferent and efferent and I type right in here what it is, right? 
and stimulus and and everything that I've had the last couple slides in one little form here. I would save this, print this, do whatever you can do to remember this. I always have questions from this from quizzes and, and exams. Okay. Nerve tissue. Neurons are the basic unit of the nervous system with three segments forming the neuron. You have dendrites, right, that transmit impulses towards the nerve body. And you have an axon which transmits impulses away from the nerve body. Dendrites towards, axons away. So you can't remember that. AA, axons away. I have nothing for dendrites because there's no other T there. Oh, this should be a review. I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. So hopefully it is a review. Uh, chemical and electrical synaptic, synaptic junctions. I can't talk. So you have the resting potential of cells at negative 70 millivolts. You have something called depolarization, repolarization, and a refractory period. That we will hit in two slides. This slide talks about the nerve body, the nerve axon, right? The synapse. Not that worried that you understand this yet. This is what you need to understand, right? So... You have a resting membrane potential of negative 70 millivolts. You have an action potential that occurs, right? You have to reach this depolarization threshold, and it's different per cell, right, for an action potential to occur. So you might have like a muscle twitch, and this might not get all the way up to the depolarization threshold, and it might not reach and may not activate, right? So when a, when a cell... Uh, membrane potential changes, it goes from negative 70 millivolts to just about 30 plus 30, right, positive millivolts. In this phase, when it's going more positive, right, that is called depolarization. We also have an absolute refractory period here that really no other action potential can occur, right? When it goes back down from plus 30 to about negative 90 millivolts, it comes back up to the resting membrane potential of negative 70 millivolts. This is called repolarization, right? So negative 70 is the resting. An action potential occurs, reaches just about, you know, plus 30 millivolts. That's the depolarization phase. As it comes back down, it repolarizes, goes back to about negative 90 millivolts, and then comes back up to the resting membrane potential of 70 millivolts. Why is that important? It is, but it isn't yet. When we talk about specific modalities, that's where we'll get more in depth with that. Common neurotransmitters, I usually actually don't really talk a lot about these, but neurotransmitters, right, that are acetylcholine, dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, serotonin, and substance P are the main what, two, four, six neurotransmitters that we really discuss in this, in this class. So if we use a modality to stimulate, I don't know, an opiate response, we might get a dopamine dump, right? And that may make the person feel high, if you will, right? Connective tissue, we have this ground substance, this gel-like substance that surrounds cells that's, <coughs> excuse me, produced by fibroblasts, right? Building fibers, right, if you will, break down the word, and collagen fibers that support and connect tissue types. Collagen is found in fascia, tendon, ligament, muscle, cartilage, bone. I love fascial pain. Fascial pain, what can cause a fascial type pain? Well, you ask Ryan, anything can cause a fascial type pain, if you will. So, person with low back pain, and you're evaluating them, and you actually go through a functional assessment on them, and you realize that they're hiked up like this, and they don't realize it, right? Well, you could do a couple different things here. If I do a myofascial release, maybe on the back, the neck, a positional release on certain muscles, and it can cause the fascia to unwind, and then it takes away their pain. Think of fascia as the outer la layer 
a thin outer layer covering a muscle. Think of it as a nice shirt, right? It's nice and ironed out. But if I have a kink in the fascia, and my shirt and my fascia starts looking all like this, it's going to cause maybe my arm to go up like this, right? Depending where it is in the body, that kink, if you will. There's a lot more research being done on fascial uh, manipulation, research done on fascial uh, treatments. And there's a great book out there called Anatomy Trains by Tom, not Tom Jones, I can't think of his name now. Um, that actually traces the fascia from your big toe all the way up to your skull. So if I've done myofascial release on, on people's backs before, and they're just, you know, they're prone, they're on their back, I'm doing myofascial release, and then their leg starts twitching, or their arm starts going up like this. They can't control that, but that's how tight their fascia is or, or kinked up, right? And you can allow that to go back into a normal process if you can treat them. Injury process, ooh. So we have two different, I guess, concepts here. We have the primary and secondary injury, and then we have the phases of the healing process. So the primary injury is associated with the tissue destruction directly resulting from a traumatic force. Bam, I tear my ACL. My ligament, right, is, is sprained, it's torn. Bam, torn my ACL. Primary injury. My secondary injury is the cell death caused by the blockage of oxygen to the area, ischemia, right, or caused by enzymatic and mitochondrial failure. So let's go back. Let's not use ACL. Let's use an ankle sprain. I sprain my ankle. This is my ankle. I invert my foot. I sprain my anterior talofibular, my ATF, most commonly sprained ankle ligament. Ow, that hurts. My ankle immediately swells up, right? Primary injury is spreading the ligament. Secondary injury is caused by the blockage of oxygen to the area, resulting in uh, tissue death, if you will. So now, if I don't treat the pro injury properly, I actually will have uh, more swelling to the area, right? If you ever have seen an ankle sprain, bam, primary injury, sprain the ligament. Secondary injury, you wait 10 minutes to evaluate them and all, and you take their shoe off and you look at them and their foot's huge, ankle's huge. Secondary injury is already occurring because that swelling has now escaped into areas that we did not want it. And further down the foot, maybe up the calf, the Achilles tendon area. So now all those areas have cell death occurring due to secondary injury. Ha! Huh. But if we put an ACE wrap on immediately, if we ACE wrap, we take the shoe off, we, we take the sock off, we poke around real quick. Yep, you think you sprained this ligament? I don't think it's fractured. Let's ace wrap it. We can limit the amount of secondary injury. We will almost never limit the primary injury, but we can always limit the secondary injury, right? That's essentially what a therapeutic modality is doing, creating the optimal environment to heal and decrease the amount of secondary injury that can occur. And the three phases of the healing process, this was always on the BOC ex exams, right? Acute inflammatory response, the proliferation phase, and then the maturation phase. So dead and damaged cells spread into areas adjacent to sites <coughs> Sorry, during the secondary injury process. Inflammatory mediators are, are sent out. Oh, that's not the slide I wanted. I thought I had a slide with inflammatory mediators. Sorry. Hemorrhage and edema occur. So bleeding, right, and swelling, edema are Edema and swelling the same thing? Actually, no, they're not. So edema starts occurring. That fluid from the bleeding, right, and the edema put pressure and cause chemical irritation and nerve receptors in the area. That actually is what causes the pain. Yes, spraining the ligament, you have right GTOs within ligaments or you have muscle sp uh, spindles within the ligament as well that can cause uh, some pain. But that's not the primary cause. If you limit the amount of fluid, essentially, the, the exudate, the junk we don't want, right? The pr and, and that's what is causing the pressure on the superficial nerve receptors in the area that causes the pain. Hypoxia or tissue death can occur due to lack of oxygen. This is known as the, sec or the injury response cycle. Injury occurs, 
dead and damaged cells spreading to areas near the site of injury. Inflammatory mediators are released. Bradykinin, classic one. Bleeding occurs, edema occurs. That bradykinin is causing that chemical irritation, the hemorrhage and uh, the bleeding, right? And the edema, uh, the fluid, right, is causing that pressure on the nerve, all causing pain. Bam. We can take away their pain. We can ace wrap immediately. That will help the fluid. We might be able to put a TENS unit or inferential current, whatever it might be, some kind of modal electrical modality to decrease their pain from the chemical irritation. Will that be a long-lasting effect? Probably not, but we can still help them initially, right? Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, primary trauma. This is out of the one book I've used in, in years past, right? So primary trauma, cell death occurs, hypoxia occurs, enzymatic injury occurs, inflammation and phagocytosis occurs. Um, yeah, we're going to hit all these eventually today anyway, so we're moving on. Acute inflammatory response. Do we need or want inflammation? Yes, we want inflammation. NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, right? The worst thing you can have your patient do is actually take an NSAID right away. Why? So say they sprain their ankle. We'll get back to the why. So say they sprain their ankle today at mowing the lawn or a football practice. We don't want them to take... Uh, an NSAID because that is going to actually decrease the amount of inflammation in the area which could prolong this acute inflammatory response phase and actually prolong their injury. Right? We want inflammation. This acute inflammatory response usually lasts, lasts zero to three to four days. So initially, as soon as they get hurt, it's about three to four days depending on the patient. Migration of phagocytes and fibroblasts of the area and formation of this granulation tissue to isolate and localize the trauma. So say you sprain your ankle. This migration of phagocytes and fibroblasts and all this granulation tissue limits that area of injury to the ankle not going up your tibia, not going down your foot. Histamine, awesome. During this time, histamine is released from traumatized cells that increases capillary permeability. If you increase capillary permeability, swelling occurs as the proteins follow water out to tissues, into the tissues, right? So if we increase the cell permeability, more free fluid, swelling, water is going to go into the area. We don't want that. We want to limit that, right? So we want to contain, destroy, dilute the injurious agents and attempts to localize tissue damage. The patient will be in pain. It's not uncommon for the patient, depending where the in, uh, what body part is injured, for the muscles to start, start spasming or even guarding. It's a natural reaction. The splints in the area protects the area. Your body's trying to protect it. Not uncommon to see this cardinal signs of inflammation. Heat, redness, swelling, pain, loss of functional function. All right, one, two, three, four, five cardinal signs of inflammation. Heat, redness, swelling, pain, loss of function. Very similar to infection. So if a patient looks like they have an infection, an infected wound, heat, redness, swelling streaks up the arm or leg, right, towards lymph nodes. That's cardinal signs of infection. A little different. The release of mediates are occur in three different stages. You have an acute, subacute, and a chronic phase. So if you're in the acute phase of the acute inflammatory response, is your body's natural reaction to injury. This lasts about 0 to 14 days. In your subacute, <coughs> excuse me, my allergies up back in mass, I'm sneezing here. Your subacute stage, so your symptoms start going away. Symptoms, right? Things that the patient tells you. Oh, my arm hurts. Or, oh, it hurts when I raise my arm above my head to comb my hair, brush my teeth, whatever it might be. <coughs> their symptoms start diminishing. And last, this lasts anywhere from about 2 weeks to a month, right? 14 to 31 days. What we don't want is the chronic inflammatory response. This is unwarranted or unwanted inflammation. This lasts about a month or more beyond the expected resolution, right? This is what we can get into some trouble with, with chronic inflammatory conditions. You have a chronic ankle sprain or chronic low back pain. You have a chronic uh, tendinopathy, Achilles tendinopathy, right? 
So this is just a little graph uh, picture, if you will, that, that shows the overlap of acute inflammation, proliferation, these maturation phases. So we talked a little bit about the acute inflammation phase that lasts anywhere from initial injury to about three days, about 72 hours after. Well, this next phase, this proliferation phase, we'll talk about in a second, starts about seven hours into injury and goes all the way about 240 hours, about 10 days after the injury. And then this last phase, maturation phase, starts about three days. So it, it overlaps with acute inflammation, proliferation phases, and could last all the way up to a month or even more, depending on what the patient is like. So we'll talk about both of those in a second here. The primary effect of this inflammatory process is to increase cell metabolism. We can cannot, can cannot, right? No. We cannot control inflammation caused by trauma. We can influence, wow, I cannot spell. We can, can. <laughs> From the Department of Redundancy of Redundancy, we can influence the delivery of leukocytes and mediators by the use of modalities. Wow, sorry about that. Apparently, I cannot spell. So we cannot control inflammation caused by trauma, right? But we can influence the delivery of leukocytes and other mediators by the use of modalities. Okay, this is this is boring stuff, right? But it's important. Back when I took A and P anatomy and physiology, I hated this stuff. I'm not gonna lie, but it's <coughs> excuse me, it is important. So the basic physiological events are occurring when you have an acute inflammatory response, right? Blood flow is ca causing margination, so platelets and leukocytes tumble along the walls of a blood vessel. Margination, platelets, leukocytes are tumbling along the walls, if you will, walls of the blood vessel. Pavementing, neutrophils adhere to the endothelial lining of a vein coming in from a capillary. So now, due to margination and, and pavementing, blood flow may escape into extravascular space. When that occurs, we have swelling, all right? So chemical mediated reactions are occurring as well. We have norepinephrine causing vasoconstriction, right? Narrowing of the arterioles. Is that good or bad? It's probably a good thing, right? So if we have vasoconstriction of the arteries, right, that are causing blood flow to escape, that's a good thing because theoretically less blood flow should be escaping. Coagulation or blood clotting is beginning to occur. So one caveat to that is if you take aspirin, blood thinner, right, or you're on a blood thinning medication already due to a blood clot or you have a bleeding dis disorder. I was born with one kidney. Um, so I go see a nephrologist once a year, right, kidney doctor for an update, make sure, you know, that one kidney is still functioning and all that stuff, right? So I actually take aspirin, no NSAID, because my kidney can process an aspirin easier. Side effect of that is my blood thins a little bit. So my acute inflammatory response might be a little more dragged out if I actually do injure myself due to my aspirin taking if... Yeah, you know, I don't take aspirin daily, but if I have a headache or whatever it might be, I'll take aspirin. So let's go back to an example. It's been about 10 minutes since your patient sprained her ankle on the soccer field. You just finished doing an evaluation, which you guys haven't really necessarily learned yet. It's actually about too late now. Vasodilation is occurring. So if it takes you about 10 minutes to do this evaluation you're actually causing that patient a little more harm, if you will, secondary injury, because vasodilation is now occurring. All right? Vasodilation, remember, opening of the blood vessel, swelling is beginning to set in, so that increases secondary injury, and that can actually prolong the healing process. Hold on one second here. <coughs> Acute inflammatory response continues. So hemorrhage may begin if two things are met. All right, bleeding will occur if two things are met. The vessel loses its continuity or ruptures, which can happen. All right. This has a marked increase in permeability so cell fluids, uh, so that fluids can escape. 
makes sense. If something's ruptured, right, it's going to leak. If you have a hose and you have a slice in the hose, a rupture, things are going to leak out of the hose. Water's going to leak out of the hose. So a pressure gradient must be present in which pressure inside the vessel is greater than external pressure. Hmm. Sounds like what an ace wrap is, right? For hemorrhage to stop, the vessel may be, must be repaired. Well, I can't do that. The body will do that eventually. What I can do is pressure gradient must be equalized. So if I take an ace wrap and I wrap it around that, that girl, that, that female patient's ankle sprain, within the first uh, roughly 10 minutes, hemorrhaging will uh, not necessarily completely stop, but it will have a great impact on hemorrhaging. Right, because now we've changed the gradient, the pressure gradient. People think I'm nuts when I say, you know what, yep, I'm going to evaluate you quickly. I think you have this. I ruled out the major things, fracture, whatever it might be. I'm going to ace wrap you immediately because I know in the long run that's going to help you and me get you back quicker. There's evidence out there, evidence-based practice. There's not much, but there's some. This proliferation phase, about 72 hours after injury, and lasts about three weeks. So this removes the debris and causes temporary repair of the tissue. And again, 72 hours to three, three weeks. It's a rough estimate, if you will. The development of new and permanent replacement tissue, resolution, regeneration, and repair of tissue is occurring. This is important because in rehabilitation interventions, if we're not stressing the tissues properly, we can create some scarring in places we don't want or scar tissue to get laid down improperly. And now we actually prolong the patient's recovery. In the re resolution phase, dead cells and cell debris are removed by phagocytosis. Tissue is left with orig its original structure and function. Those cells and that, those tissues are left with the original function, what they're meant to do. During the regeneration phase, damaged tissues are replaced by cells of the same type, right? And then the structure remains, uh, retains some or all of the original structure and function. And it's different with every single cell and tissue. That's why I'm not going necessarily in depth and, uh, yes, this cell for this ankle does this, right? It's different with everything. During the repair phase, original tissue is replaced with scar tissue and original structure and function can be lost. Ooh, chronic conditions. Inflammation is a passive process. The body forms new and possibly unwanted connective tissues that causes that chronic pain or chronic inflammation. We have to trick it to get out of the inflammation phase. So PRP, right, or uh, prolotherapy and, and, and gaining or blood cells injected back into you to re-stimulate the inflammation phase. That's actually kind of, you know, it's kind of hot right now, if you will, but there's actually a lot of research coming out that says, uh, sorry, this actually doesn't really work. Um, and I love debate. So uh, you guys will have some article discussions coming up. If you want to find articles on prolotherapy, P-R-O, low, right, therapy or PRP, uh, injections. Find them. I love healthy, good debates and, and what the evidence says, right? Please find some. Put them on the discussion boards. Let's talk. What about your patient? So let's say your patient sprained her ankle at her soccer game on Saturday. Her next game is Tuesday. Well, Saturday to Sunday is 24 hours to Monday is 48 hours to Tuesdays, uh, about three days. So three days, they're just beginning the proliferation phase, right? And coming out of the complete inflammatory response. So there is a, an overlap with this. Wound contraction and wound healing, we're actually going to hit more uh, later in the summer with specific modalities because you can actually do some wound contraction and wound remodeling with certain modalities. In AT, we don't necessarily use them as much. And you can see some pictures here. Um, but in PT, OT, occupational therapy, right, physical therapy, uh, inpatients with bed sores and stuff, you'll see that a lot more. Okay, we'll hit that more in depth later this summer. 
the maturation phase is the final phase of injury response process. What about all these patients that have ACL tears? So this may last about a year or more. So ACL, anterior cruciate ligament, right? All the time. People tear their ACLs all the time. In my short life as an athletic trainer, um, I like to think of myself as young still. So it's my short life as an AT. It, it, it's uh, it's cyclical, right? You, you've had, <laughs> when I first started, ACLs coming back in a year, all the way down to four months. Yes, I've actually had a patient come back in three months. It's my fastest from ACL surgery. Uh, I was not actually not the lead, if you will, on this rehab. Uh, I thought it was a little quick. But if you think about an ACL tear and these patients are coming back, you know, let's say six to eight months from their surgical date, when they go back out and start playing, they're still in the maturation phase. So there is still cleaning up going on. They're still sh increasing the strength of the repaired tissue, replaced tissue. There's still collagen being laid down, right? So they're still at risk after, you know, about a year. They're not at, as much at, at risk. Um, and I don't know the stats. I'd be interested to see. I guess I don't know them off the top of my head. Of... Uh, patients retearing their ACL and return to play. Collagen. Most musculoskeletal injuries are repaired by replacement of the tissues, right? Increasing where stresses must be applied to collagen to encourage its proper organization and allow for maximum tensile strength. Pretty much, collagen is our friend. We want collagen in a proper way. Whew. We're almost done here. We've got a handful of things left to talk about. So secondary injury, right? Secondary hypoxic injury, so we don't want tissue death, causes this cell death due to a decrease in oxygen supply to the area. Hemorrhaging from damaged vessels, so bleeding, right, from damaged vessels, reduced blood flow maybe, caused by an increase in thickness in the blood, hydrophic swelling of damaged cells and pressure from the hematoma and spasm may block the supply of fresh blood and result in tissue death. Secondary injury is first seen in mitochondria, right, the powerhouse of the cell, within 30 minutes following primary trauma. So look at this. Application of cold packs ice within 30 minutes following trauma can decrease the amount of secondary injury. I don't buy it. I teach this class. I, I taught uh, uh, modalities and intervention class for five, six years now. I don't buy that statement. Books will put that in there. I think it's a crock. If there are research articles you can find to prove me wrong, please do. I'd love to be proven wrong. Please prove me wrong. Okay, swelling is the increase in the volume of a body part as the result of fluid buildup. Capillary permeability increases after injury, making it easier for fluids and solid matter to leave the vessels. So if the pressure inside the ves vessel, this vascular hydrostatic pressure, exceeds the pressure outside the vessel, flu fluids are forced out of the capillaries into the tissues and swelling results. We don't want that, right? So if we normalize that pressure, ACE wrap, we can limit the amount that is escaping and causing the swelling. Now edema is different, right? Edema is a buildup of excessive fluid and protein in the interstitial space resulting from an imbalance uh, between the pressures inside and outside the cell membrane or obstruction of lymphatic return and venous return mechanisms. Edema disrupts lymphatic flow. Why is that important? Well, the lymphatic system helps remove solid waste. It helps remove all the junk we don't want from that area. We can stimulate lymphatic flow, though. Massage can do this. So if you've ever sprained your ankle, you may have seen this in an athletic training facility somewhere. They do a milk massage, right? They may, after an ankle sprain... <laughs> Heat the patient's calf with a moist hot pack. That dilates the blood vessels. Then they might put them on their stomach, bend their knee up, 
and then start milk massaging from their foot, their toes, all the way down to where they had that hot pack on. That will actually move some of the lymphatic uh, edema to the lymphatic system to move that swelling or edema, excuse me, edema out. And then if we re ace wrap that patient, they should have less edema built up. It's awesome. We'll do some milk massage. It's not, I don't know why we call it milk massage. I do know, but it's a little weird term, right? So we'll do some milking um, later in the summer when we meet on campus. The amount of edema that accumulates in the injured area is proportional to the severity of injury, right? The number and cell, uh, type of cells damaged. So that really goes back to that uh, grade one, grade two, grade three sprain for a ligament, strain for a muscle, right? So if we have a grade one injury, there's some damage and, and cell damage, but there's not a lot. Versus grade three, right? Typically a complete, complete rupture or tear of the muscle or ligament. And that's the greatest amount of cell damage we can have. Changes in vascular permeability, the amount of primary and secondary hemorrhage, the high pressure gradient, right? If we can change the gradient of the pressure inside of it versus outside the cell. And then the presence of this chemical inflammatory mediators. We can't always change the inflammatory mediators um, that your body's releasing, but we can alter the perception of those with therapeutic interventions, right? Notice I said perception, right? It's a key word there. <clears throat> Swelling and edema, the primary goal during the injury, early injury management is to decrease the formation of edema and remove swelling from injured site. Guess what? Yes, ice application does reduce edema formation, but it does nothing for swelling. Remember, they're different. People don't always understand that. Edema is removed by increasing venous and lymphatic return, gravity, blood circulation, and uh, compression. The primary mechanism for removing that protein that we don't want in the interstitial, so the space between, if you will, it's a song by John Mayer anyways, the space between is through the lymphatic system. So if we make sure our lymphatic system is working properly, we can actually reduce the amount of edema. Starling's Law. BOC loves this. Remember, BOC is your national exam that you can take after the you, uh, the last semester you're in the grad, uh, before you graduate to become a certified alpha trainer. Uh, so Starling's Law. This describes the amount of movement of fluids across capillary membrane that results in formation or removal of swelling. And guess what? Bunch of, of uh, fancy words here coming up. This can be stated as the vascular hydrostatic pressure and the interstitial fluid colloid, really, osmotic pressure forces the contents from the capillary outward to the tissue. Okay, so we have swelling out. The plasma colloid, osmotic pressure moves fluids from tissues into the capillaries. Awesome. And the limb's hydrostatic pressure is altered uh, by changes in the position of the limb. Huh. So what does this mean? If we compress and elevate, that changes. So compression changes these, right? And elevation changes this last bullet point. That's all we need. We don't need ice, right? Rest, eh. Ice, not really. If we look back at right, the rice term, right, that, that was termed back in 1978. Rest, ice, eh. Compression, yeah. Due to Starling's Law, right here, these two bad boys. Elevation, bam, right here. If we have a patient with an ankle sprain and we compress and elevate them, going old school, elevation using pillows, ace wrap you, with compression, this can change the amount of edema to the area. Changes it due to Starling's law. Nowadays, we have devices called Game Readies, right, that does ice with the compression. We have Normatex. We have different types of modalities, <coughs> interventions that we can use to help, really, with Starling's Law. Okay. Other possible consequences of injury. Muscle spasm is going to occur. Almost always. You tear your ACL, you're going to have spasm um, in your quadriceps and hamstrings. And that's really to help uh, the involuntary contraction of the muscle fibers helps split and protect the area. 
It's your body's natural reaction. If you've ever fractured a bone, you usually have a spasm around the bone that your body's trying to splint itself, right? This could be caused from direct trauma, decreased oxygen, even neurological deficit. We have muscle, at muscle atrophy and weakness. So atrophy is different than weakness, right? So disuse atrophy versus denerv denervation atrophy. So disuse, I'm not using it, therefore I don't have a muscle, muscle mass anymore. Denervation is that nerve coming out of my cervical spine, my neck, that may feed this, or feed my deltoid, let's say, um, is being blocked for some reason, that neurotransmission. Right? So chiropractors really, really uh, work on this premise of subluxations, and by manipulating that subluxation, we're providing the nerve the optimal environment, right, to heal itself. So C5, fifth cervical vertebra in your neck, right, that feeds deltoid right here. All right. So if I have a patient that has deltoid atrophy, so not a lot of muscle mass on their deltoid here, all right, that could mean a couple different things. It could mean I just have disuse atrophy, something else going on, or it could actually be coming from my neck. So if I treat the patient's neck, does their atrophy improve? Maybe. All right. Okay, chronic inflammation often caused by low intensity irritants. So they're like the ankle biters. They're like the mosquitoes outside when you're outside enjoying a campfire. Those little buggers keep biting you. They're the irritants, low intensity irritants. You can develop uh, chronic inflammation actually without going through the acute stages, which is kind of interesting. Um, that chronic inflammation is definitely a strong predictor of future disability, so future problems, right? Signs include production of fibrous connective and granulation tissue, infiltration of mononuclear cells. Eh, I'm not that word that you understand that yet. Okay. How does cold decrease swell? Mm. As cold decreases secondary hypoxic injury, the amount of free proteins and tissues decreases. That amount or that decrease in free t proteins in the tissues causes less tissue pressure which is the major factor for edema notice difference right cold can prevent edema from occurring only if it's applied soon after injury once edema develops cold application cannot decrease edema Ooh. Misconceptions. Many people think the purpose of ice is to decrease inflammation. No. However, we're not. Yeah, inflammation is necessary to prepare for healing. Healing cannot take place until much of the cellular debris is removed from the area. So decreasing inflammation is not helpful. The NSAIDs, right, they're not helpful right away. So this is some thought-provoking questions, right, that you can think about on your own here. Misconception results from confusing inflammation with swelling. What are the differences of inflammation? What is the differences between inflammation and swelling? I don't know. What do you think? I do know, but I'm not going to tell you. All right. The more swelling is contained, the quicker the injury can heal. Ice, the last misconception. Another misconception concerning ice is that it shouldn't be used until the swelling is gone. No. Acti uh, ice is effective at preventing swelling but not removing swelling. Swelling reduction occurs as free protein is removed from the area. So we can do that many different ways, right? Conclusion. Ooh, inflammation is in the body. Okay, let's start over here. Inflammation is the body's response to any injury. Protects the body against invasion of foreign bodies. Prepares the injured tissue for repair. Ooh. After understanding inflammation, hemorrhaging, edema, you'll be qualified to educate your patients who commonly apply ice to decrease uh, inflammation after injury. You can explain that swelling is one of the cardinal signs of inflammation, but is not the process itself. They are separate but related processes. All right. Okay, so that is the conclusion of, bam, pathomechanics of injury response and healing.
the next lecture is pain L literally pain pain theories pain concepts it is pretty heavy there's some good science in this lecture and hopefully a lot of it was review from a and p but the next lecture whoo you may not have ever heard of a pain theory before but you're going to so hopefully i can put up this uh, next lecture here this after or this morning up on youtube for you guys please remember as you're going through this powerpoint as you go through or this this video lecture up on youtube email me text me if you have any questions i'd love to chat if you have questions if i didn't explain something properly or confused you please we can facetime we can do whatever i am fine with that